Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, everyone, for taking time out of your Saturday morning and early as it is. Uh, I'd like to thank you uh, for coming and uh, to this uh, Greater Vancouver Virtual Effective Speaking competition. Uh, my name is Jermaine, and I am the Effective Speaking Coordinator for BC. Uh, I would like to begin by acknowledging that we are on the lands of which we gather is the unceded territories of the Coast Salish peoples, including the territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. Uh, today we will have uh, five cadets competing, and uh, here's, our, here's a few housekeeping rules uh, to cover. Out of respect to the speakers, judges, and audience, we do ask you are muted during the competition. The competition is being recorded, and the videos will be posted on the BCPC website once approved. Please decide prior to speech beginning if you would like your video on or off. We will monitor the audio and visual while the speech is in progress. Once this meeting is announced as beginning, those entering late will be admitted in between the speeches, so please be patient. The format for today is as follows. Each speaker will present a five to six minutes prepared speech with a two minute break for judges to mark. We ask for your cooperation in keeping your systems muted while our judges score. After all prepared speeches are complete, we will have the judges email their marking sheets to the designated email addresses. Today, we also have three esteemed judges. Uh, one is a tag team pair, uh, a couple. So we will have them as uh, judging under one marking sheet, uh, but three esteemed judges with us today. Thank you, judges. We will have a short 15 minutes break, then commence with the impromptu section of competition. The impromptu speeches will be two to three minutes each and will be presented in reverse order. The speakers will not know the topic of the speech until they are given three minutes to prepare prior to their turn. After the completion of the speeches, we will tally the scores and then announce the top three names. The gold medalist will continue on to the provincial competition, which is held on April the 23rd, 2022, uh, again on Zoom. Details to follow, or you can uh, email me at effectivespeaking.bcpc at gmail.com, and I will send you the details. So with all that complete, let's start and have some fun. Without further ado, it is my privilege to introduce to you speaker one. Should every student be required to learn at least one additional language? Should every student be required to learn at least one additional language? Speaker one. Good morning to all the judges, officers, parents, guests, and to my fellow cadets. Growing up, I learned to understand and speak three languages at home, English, Cantonese, and Japanese. But of course, I'm only actually fluent in one of these three languages. I'll let you figure out which one that is. I was also pushed to learn Mandarin and French all throughout my time in school. And I'm still learning French now as due to BC's curriculum requirements. I'll even tell you all about my not so fun experience with learning languages throughout elementary twice a week for French and every day after school for Mandarin. I won't lie because truthfully, I absolutely hated it in both these classes. You can only imagine how bored I was getting nowhere in it. I loved school, but these two subjects made it painful. One minute I'm learning math and then the next I'm being bombarded in another language I clearly don't understand. Bonjour, parlez-vous français? No. My second grade brain could not and absolutely would not accept this. And then if my long day at school couldn't get any longer, I would have to go back at 4 p.m. every day to learn Mandarin for an hour. There were many instances where I was so sick of it. I told my mom outright in the car on the way home from school, I hate it. It's boring, it's useless. I already know and can speak English. So what's the point? where of course I was met with the most overstated facts that I'm sure many of us have heard about learning languages. 
all the many job opportunities, greater advantages, and traveling made easier. But to me, I didn't care, because after many years of protest, I had already made my peace with subtitles and my inability to order food at the Chinese restaurants. All this because my reasoning behind it all was that if I already knew one language, why would I put more time into trying to understand another when we have instant translation at our fingertips? And if we speak a language like English, that it's on its way to becoming one of the most spoken languages in the world, we question why we have to learn another one. But I'm here to explain why I believe not just every student, but every person should learn at least an additional language. Language itself is a mental exercise, learning to constantly juggle the different vocabulary, sentence structures, ideas, and even down to the pronunciation. I can understand the struggle of this growing up trilingual, but I also understand the struggle of trying to force new sentence structures and vocabulary into my brain while learning French and Mandarin. Language learning is something so easily accessible with apps which many of us know, such as Duolingo, so widely available to us. But it's difficult, it's time consuming, and it's boring. Many people think it's best to put time elsewhere to do more productive things since they see no progress in the, learning, the language they're learning. And besides the many well-known facts of learning another language, improving your memory, brain function, and enhancing your ability to multitask, it also helps us to connect the dots to where languages we speak are similar and where they differ. Learning another language also expands your perspective of the world and the people in it. Have you ever tried to speak in another language? Now, I don't mean speaking the basics. Hello, how are you? I'm good. Thank you. Goodbye. Not that. I mean really speak it. Hold a conversation in another language and be able to communicate yourself well enough to be understood. Now, if you aren't bilingual, multilingual, or in any way fluent like me, you know it's difficult. It requires a lot of confidence, concentration, and skill that even today I'm trying hard to work on. But the language allows you to articulate yourself, express your personality, emotions, and thoughts about who you are as a person. The language, as with all things, can also act as a barrier. The minute you're forced to speak a language you're not as comfortable with or fluent in, you become a shell of the person you are. It goes the same when you speak to others who aren't fluent in the language you're, we speak in. You don't get to know someone completely when you can't fully articulate yourself in another language. Language connects us. It allows us to understand others. And even by knowing just another language, it gives us another opportunity to get to know another group of people that aren't fluent in your native language. It lets us immerse ourselves in different cultures and understand how to see the world differently through the language we speak. And this is why learning another language is so important. Because even if we already know one, there are only positive benefits for learning a second. And for me, knowing English isn't enough. And in a world where we so openly embrace inclusivity and multiculturalism, learning a second language opens doors for opportunities far beyond tentative benefits, but for a world that lets us view another perspective. Now, I thank my mom for scolding me for complaining about learning languages, as now I actually enjoy learning French at school. I try harder to speak Cantonese and Japanese at home because I don't want to forget or lose my ability to speak another language. Every day, it pushes me to practice and speak up more and then tests my confidence and communication skills. And yes, there'll be those days where I can't see the difference it makes now, but I promise you, through the effort, perseverance, and dedication you put in, learning a second language can really make just the smallest difference in your life and even in the world. Now I ask you, what language will you continue learning, or if not, start learning? Thank you. Thank you, speaker one. Moving along, we have speaker two. What is the biggest current threat to the environment and how would you suggest we remedy it? What is the biggest current threat to the environment and how would you suggest we remedy it? Speaker number two. In 1967, meteorologist Soyokoro Manabe used his state-of-the-art digital computer for a little side project. His project was a basic model of the atmosphere and the effects of water vapor changes due to increased carbon dioxide. What he found 
was shocking. His findings were compiled into a series of models that showed the effects of increasing levels of carbon dioxide on the planet's climate. Since then, the entire world has engaged in a 50 year long debate over this issue, over whether or not the climate was changing, about whether or not it was because of human activity, over the seriousness of the, situ the situation and what actions to take and who to bear the costs and who to take the blame. And while that's happening, 33 billion tons of carbon dioxide is released every year. Climate change is real. Things are only getting worse. And it's possible that all of our progress globally over the past 50 years hasn't even been focused on the worst issue. Good morning. I'm Warren Officer, Second Class Aid in Cleveland here. Let's talk about climate change. When the world initially realized the seriousness of climate change, dirty power production, agricultural and industrial practices of the 1970s were actively releasing pollutants into the atmosphere. For decades, particulates from coal plants and steel forges and general industry slowly acidified airborne precipitation, leading to what we now know as acid rain. This was the first time an active environmental consequence of human activity was recognized. And shortly after this, clean air policies started to be enacted globally. This marked the first global effort to reduce emissions for the health of the climate. While large particulate emissions have decreased since then, our carbon dioxide and methane emissions have only gotten worse. Emissions from big industries have skyrocketed despite our awareness of the effects. Now, it's pretty easy to blame fossil fuel companies, factories, and transportation for the climate crisis, but you gotta take it easy. It's not that simple. In Canada, there's been quite a bit of attention placed on personal human impact for good reason. While Canadians across the country are making changes to be more responsible, Canada ranks seventh in the world for global emissions per capita at 18 tons of carbon dioxide per person per year behind famously green countries like Qatar and the UAE. China, by the way, is ranked 42nd on that list at seven tons per person. Now, these numbers do include industrial emissions, but it's clear that all of us need to make serious changes in our personal lives if we want to lead the world in climate change prevention. But you've probably heard this before. Recycle, cut down on meat and dairy, and shop locally, drive, drive less, and use transit more, live a green life. That's all fine, but that's way harder than it sounds. First, if you live in a rural area, it can be really hard to avoid driving. There's like five bus routes in my entire district, and some of those routes only get three buses a day. From my house, it's 15 kilometers to the nearest bus stop. I end up driving. Recycling, that's pretty effortless, and it's great for glass and metal, but only about 20% of our household plastics get recycled. Your hard plastics like ABS and PET, think your water bottles and your food trays, those can be melted down and reused, but soft plastics like plastic bags and wrap, those are pretty much impossible to recycle, and they end up getting incinerated. So much for recycling. Changing our eating and shopping habits, that's easier, but expensive. Think about the price increase on organic foods, on items made in Canada. A lot of people can't afford that. I'm broke, so I end up ordering on Amazon. It's very easy to get comfortable with our modern luxuries, but without the desire to change, we're not gonna get anywhere. Now, I started the speech out very dramatically. Do you remember when I said things are only getting worse? I can imagine some of you hung your head when you heard me talk. Some of you maybe even rolled your eyes. You've heard all of this before. That, in my opinion, is the biggest problem with climate change. Shame and apathy. Shaming people causes them to shut down, which leads to them not caring. I can't tell you how many times I've heard people say excuses like, yeah, well, big businesses are polluting left and right, so me leaving my car running is really not a problem, or the meat's already been made. I'm not hurting the planet plus the planet by eating it. Or even if climate change is inevitable, why fight it? we're trying to achieve the impossible. I can't blame these people for the way they feel. Reducing climate change can seem like an insurmountable challenge. However, earlier, you heard me talk about acid rain. There's a reason why we don't talk about that anymore. Do you know why? It's because we fixed it. We worked to eliminate the emissions responsible for acidification and it worked. We've done this before. Acid rain is practically eliminated because governments and citizens globally made an effort to reduce particulate emissions. The same thing can be done today. We individually 
have to change our thinking. So how do you do that? Well, you can start by thinking about your personal impact. Start small, pick one thing and try to change it. Maybe try eating local foods for a week. Maybe try walking to school or work. If you buy stuff online, pick ground shipping over ammo, things like that. Awareness is key. Think about your impact and keep it in mind as you make decisions. Sure, you might not feel like you're changing the world when you do these things, but as long as you're making an effort to do better than you did yesterday, you're doing your part. And with us all being more responsible together, globally, we'll solve this, just like we did with Athed Rain. Thank you very much. Thank you, speaker two. Moving along, we have speaker three. Should classes about mental health and wellness be added to school curriculum? Should classes about mental health and wellness be added to school curriculum? Speaker three. Good morning, honorable judges, fellow cadets, and distinguished guests. We are currently living in a pandemic, not just a COVID pandemic, but also a silent pandemic, a mental health pandemic. And the problem with this pandemic is not that it can spread so easily, not that it is hard to identify, not even because it can cause massive amounts of harm. Yes, all of these consequences of bad mental health are tragic, but the biggest issue of all is that it is so hard to treat and to get help. Teenagers are disproportionately affected by mental health struggles. And as such, we must find ways to support them through such a tough and unknown time in their lives, which is why we should implement mental health and wellness classes into the school curriculum. Right now in school, we don't really learn that much about mental health. It's just the usual, if you need help, go talk to the counselor and nothing much more than that. So none of us students really know that much about mental health. But what's worse is that the people who need help don't know where to get it. This is especially a problem for teens. The teenage years are a time of change. It's when little kids turn into young adults. And with that change comes many challenges as well. And when teenagers perpetually face challenges without help, that is when their mental health declines but they can't be open about it. And that is because as a society, we treat mental health as a taboo subject. People don't want to talk about it. And that's partially why so many teens struggle with their mental health. They feel like they can't talk about it with others and that they can't find help. Now, this is where mental health classes come in. At school, during this class, Students could be able to learn more about mental health and how to stay healthy, not only physically, but also mentally. Not only would this educate the next generation about something that so many people face, but students would also be able to use this information in their own lives to help themselves and their friends. And these mental health classes would definitely be feasible. Even if you don't have enough teachers or time, mental health and wellness could be easily inserted as a unit into a careers class or a science class, for example. We already have so many classes that talk about things related to us. There are already so many things we learn at school, but oddly enough, we don't learn enough about ourselves and about our mental health. And I find that fact very alarming. Our education system will teach us the quadratic formula and y equals mx plus b, but more often than not, it won't teach us about ourselves and how to keep us healthy. But we have a chance to change that. Just quick classes about what is mental health? What are some struggles that some people face at your age? How do you help someone struggling with their mental health? Those are such vital things to know about. And thus, it is imperative that we do start teaching this in our schools. And these classes wouldn't just be a place to learn about mental health, but they would also be a place to talk about it. As I already said, mental health is a taboo subject, and that fact won't change overnight. 
And it's not easy to just start talking about mental health, even with someone really close to you, like your parents or your family, especially if you need help. But what these classes would do would also allow students who need help, who need support, the resources they need in order to access it. And even if someone doesn't want to go look for support, that mental health teacher, that trusted adult can be another person who can help you, who you can talk to, because they probably understand what you are going through. In conclusion, we need mental health and wellness classes in our schools, because it's the only way that we can adequately educate and address the pressing issue of mental health. By bringing these topics into our classrooms, we allow for a more open environment where students can learn and seek help if they need it. Because if the purpose of schools and our education system is to prepare us for the future, us students must be taught about mental health and how to maintain good mental wellness. Because without it, this pandemic will continue to spread and hurt many others. But if we start a conversation about mental health and give resources for teens to access help, we will be able to alleviate the harms of this pandemic and hopefully in the future, end it once and for all. Thank you. Thank you, speaker three. And moving along to speaker four. Speaker four, should classes about mental health and wellness be added to school curriculum? Should classes about mental health and wellness be added to school curriculum? Speaker four. Good morning, judges guests and cadets, I'm Corporal Lee. You may think it's easy to be young, but it's no walk in the park, believe me. Anxiety is ever present, especially for my generation. Sure, anxiety is a natural part of being human, and it's also an understandable part of our era. Yes, in contemporary times, many social factors cause mental health stresses at the same time that society more than ever before, pays a lot of attention to how well people are doing inside. In fact, since so many of us have mental or emotional challenges, here's an important question for you to consider. Should classes about mental health and wellness be added to school curriculum? I say, why not? I think it's a fairly good idea because it would help us break through the age old stigma surrounding having issues and talking about them. Come on, you know you can't be at your best when you feel physically ill. It's the same for mental health. You've got to address and heal those problems so that you can live your optimum life. Did you know that one in six North American youth experience a mental health disorder annually and that an estimated 31.9% have an anxiety disorder? Those are significant numbers. Do you see why we need to learn to talk about these problems, that we need to make it feel safe for people to be vulnerable. There's no shame in stopping the internal harm, so we've got to help each other because aside from their own homes, young people spend the majority of their time at school. So the sooner we work together to build that positive atmosphere, the sooner we can enjoy its benefits. And what better way to combat mental health stigma than through young people? Creating an open environment to talk about mental health in school will lead to thoughtful conversations surrounding the issues students face. Students will feel empowered to reach out to a trusted family member, teacher, or friend when needed. It has to become just as normal and acceptable to seek mental health support at a professional's practice or through a helpline as it is to seek physical health support at a clinic or hospital. No, mental health concerns are not shameful. They're just a part of us. It's time to accept and to medically treat whenever necessary, all aspects of ourselves. Case in point, worry is so common for us, isn't it? We, the Zoomers, Generation Z, so often say through accents just as much as words, help me, please, I can't control my negative feelings. Too many feelings. Yes, me too. I've got 99 problems and a solid 90 of them are made up in my own head. I think it's a fairly relatable phenomenon. For example, a guy in my socials class was called upon to answer a question. He shot up from his seat and simply stared at the front of the room with a blank look on his face, wondering what was going on. 
we all started to look at one another and at him, which unfortunately probably made him even more nervous. Finally, in explanation, he said, hey on guys, I'm not dumb, I'm just panicking. As pronounced as this incident might sound, it's quite common, as it demonstrates the effect that social and academic anxiety can have on students' ability to respond and perform advantageously. I feel so sorry for the guy. I mean, his situation was just like when your teacher asks you to choose a project theme or an example to illustrate a principle and you just don't know what to say and anxiety floods in. <clears throat> what would you do? Hey, that was a pretty good example of anxiety I gave you there. All right, here's another one. If someone says, can I ask you something? And you instantly reply, sure, go ahead. But your mind has already gone through the seven stages of grief, anticipating a negative comment from them. Or when someone is late for hanging out, like they were supposed to be there at 6 p.m., they didn't arrive. And you start spiraling, questioning your own awareness of the details. Was 6 the actual time we were supposed to meet? Is this the actual place? Do I really know this person? Do they exist? Do I exist? Am I going out of my mind? Look at us. We're able to jump to the worst conclusions in a single bound. Superheroes of dismal forecast, exhausting ourselves, climbing mountains of misperceptions. Most of them have to do with our fragile self-image. We should instead become really good at discussing our painful feelings and impressions, seeking help with healing them and finding where they come from, and then learning to feel great about ourselves and our lives. I mean, just because I can't explain the feeling causing my anxiety doesn't make it less valid, right? Plus, I'm only a teenager. Am I really supposed to know everything about myself? Do you guys? About yourselves? Okay, maybe some of you do. But you know what? I think inspirational young readers, John Green, said it really well. I give myself permission to be bad at stuff, okay? Why not? It's the only way to learn, to grow in one's ability, and to eventually rock. Step by step, we will get better, and we will have fulfilling lives. You gotta feel a bit first, then try, try again. We just have to keep reminding ourselves of that and not expect the world in one day because being awesome takes time. Thank you. Thank you, speaker four. Onward to our speaker five. What are the biggest challenges faced by youths today? What are the biggest challenges faced by youths today? Speaker five. Sitting at the cafeteria tables, laughter erupts out of all of us. We recall the funny moments, the happy moments. We smile, but we don't see what happens underneath the masks, underneath those smiles, underneath that thick skin we perceive as happiness. Judges, parents, fellow cadets, thank you so much for coming here to discuss a very prevalent issue in society with me today. My name is Warrant Officer Second Class Megan Tai, and I have always been passionate about challenges my generation faces. Unfortunately, there are many challenges we must face, global warming, discrimination, substance abuse, and many more. But from my perspective of this generation, one of the biggest challenges we face today is finding our worthiness and the true meaning of happiness. Now to understand what is going on with youth today, I want you to close your eyes and allow me to take you back in time. Every day after school, a mother asked her daughter, on a scale of one to 10, how was your day? A 10, the teacher let us have an even longer recess today. She'd reply or sometimes it would be a seven because her friend didn't come to school today. Time and time again, the young girl would always have a new story to tell, and time and time again, her mother would smile, knowing her daughter was well. On one peculiar afternoon, however, the mother asked her daughter once again, on a scale of one to ten, how was your day? It was okay, she said bluntly. Confused as to why her daughter was so silent, she asked what was going on. Nothing was all she could say. And even though the radio played and the bustling traffic sounded, the entire ride felt silent. That silence never ended. A wall grew, and instead of her parents trying to understand the structure and its power, they turned away from it. They tried to look over the wall, and they put shiny new books on the girl's arms while she balanced a calculator, a piano, lessons, competitions, and even more books, all for that sparkling piece of paper we call a resume. 
As long as she can bounce and isn't crumbling behind the wall, it doesn't matter how much we give her. What if I told you there was another wall? Another wall just as powerful as the first. It grew ever since she heard a friend say harmful things about her just because she wanted to share more about her life. Instead of avoiding this friend, she continued to spend time with them, but vowed to never share her true feelings. She promised to agree with everything she heard just so that she could hold on to more people. She never really made any real friends, though, not realizing it at the time, that's how her second wall grew. She thought she could impress people with how she dressed, what she bought, how she conducted herself online, designer labels and material things that no one even noticed but herself. The small spots of acne no one could even see unless they stood a few millimeters close to her. What are hip dips anyways? What's the fastest way to lose weight? Why am I not beautiful enough? Always self-conscious, she developed another wall even more quickly than the previous two, caused by anxiety over societal norms and fear of negative judgment. Three walls were already up, and if one more wall decided to grow as rapidly as the first, who knew what would happen to her? She had hoped things would get better. Even when her life seemed to be crumbling to pieces, she had hope. She wanted to live, but what if I told you someone else wished for her to have never existed because they thought the world would be better off without her? That opening, hope, was quickly replaced by a final wall and trapping her in a cell, a continuous spiral of thoughts she never thought she would ever think of. Family, friends, freedom of expression and hope, the walls prevented her from grasping such concepts that were once right in front of her, now gone. Was it her fault they were gone? Was it her fault to have put herself in this situation? The walls were starting to cave in and before the very last glint of light wanted to disappear, she knew she wanted to live. She knew she wanted to be happy. If I ended here, you may be wondering what exactly happened to this little girl. Did she manage to break down these walls and climb out of the very dark space of emptiness or did it consume her? I'm fortunate enough to say that this young girl is standing in front of you all today. I'm grateful to have managed to find a safe space to reach out to others and to tell my story, which helped me on my journey of finding true happiness. I wish I could say that it was an easy journey that every little boy and girl has gotten over the walls, but unfortunately, this is not the case for everyone. Struggling to find happiness and worthiness is a struggle my generation tends to face in our everyday lives. We all experience obstacles in our lives. They come at us at different times and different situations, and we have to address them differently. To overcome them is a treacherous journey because it's terrifying not knowing what life might throw at you. The most important thing to understand is that while we all struggle to find joy and worthiness at times, it is all part of the journey. This journey may be filled with turbulence, but eventually you'll land at the sunniest paradise. I implore you to keep an open mind and an open heart, treat people with compassion, with kindness. You never know what someone else may be going through. Even a simple act of kindness may end up changing someone's life. Thank you, Speaker Five. And that concludes our prepared speeches. Thank you everyone for your time. Uh, we are all ready. Uh, we do have a cadet in our impromptu write-up room right now prepping. And uh, we're just going to begin with uh, this section of competition. So with impromptu section of competition, we do perform in reverse order. Uh, they have uh, three minutes in that write-up room to prep their speech and then come out and perform a two to three minute speech for us. Um, as of now, they are still working on their speech. And it looks like we have uh, quite a few prominent uh, audience members with us today, uh, other than our three esteemed judges, uh, four tag team, <laughs> welcome. And also uh, we have our GV wing chair, Ms. Sheila Kang. And then we have, I think, 888's full representation uh, with our league rep, Ms. Catherine Chak. We have their uh, SSC chair, Wilma. Uh, and we have their CEO, Major Lee. And I do see Major Alguire here too with 5-9 Vancouver. So thank you again, uh, sir, for joining us today. And of course we have our 
Captain Dave Douglas, our host, Squadron 858. Uh, thank you again, uh, sir. You and your team are um, such great support to this program and also to me as a coordinator. It has been uh, quite interesting on this year being uh, the second year on uh, trying to get information and having, I do understand that it has been challenging for our commanding officers um, and chair uh, people um, being the second year virtual that uh, to inspire and to get our cadets engaged in this environment. Okay, so let's begin. I've talked enough. It is my pleasure to introduce to you speaker five. And the impromptu question is, what is the most adventurous ride you have ever taken? What is the most adventurous ride you have ever taken? Speaker five. A few years ago, I went to Disney World. Yes, the happiest place on earth, where there are Disney princesses, castles, merry-go-rounds, and many more. But I just wanted to say, Prince Eric is my absolute favorite. But one of the most adventurous rides I went on during my time at Disney World was the Tower of Terror. Now, when I saw that ginormous tower, probably five times or 10 times taller than my short 5'3 self, I was terrified. I guess that's why it's called the Tower of Terror. Now, when I was waiting in line, I grabbed my cell phone and I searched up, how scary is the Tower of Terror? And some people said it was horrifying. And some people said that it wasn't that bad, but I was terrified. And right before we got to the front of the line, I told my parents, I can't do this. I cannot do this. They said, we spent this much money on Disney World, you are going on the Tower of Terror. So I did it. I went inside the ride and I sat down on that chair and got strapped in and it started. We were going up the Tower of Terror and we were entering rooms filled with animatronic ghosts. And even though the ghosts didn't really scare me, it was the heights and we went up and up and up till we reached the top and I realized oh it's time to go it's time to go down and we went down and it actually wasn't that scary it was a really fun ride actually we went up and down and we were screaming and even though I was with many adults they were screaming even louder than I was and I just realized this adventurous ride wasn't as scary as I thought it would be and I really wanted to relate it to life. It's a metaphor for life. We can't search things up on the internet all the time and think, oh, this will happen to us, all these bad things or all these good things, because we don't understand these things unless we try it ourselves. And this is why this was the most adventurous ride I have ever been on. Thank you. Thank you. Speaker five. Speaker four. Your impromptu question was, what is the most adventurous ride you have ever taken? What is the most adventurous ride you have ever taken? Speaker four. All right, so the question is, what is the most adventurous ride I've ever taken? So I believe every traveler has their ultimate list of things to experience around the world, including myself, even though I'm not, not that much of a traveler, but, I've done skydiving, scuba diving, just kidding. Those are the things that I wanna try, but am super scared of doing it. Surprisingly, and I'm proud to say that the most adventurous ride that I've ever done was to go on a roller coaster. I know some people think that this is weird, but to me, this is the most adventurous thing I've ever done. I'm afraid of heights terribly afraid of heights I would not be able to climb to a space net that's only around like two feet tall because I don't know I'm just scared of falling down and breaking a bone that's just not my style so for me 
Going on one of the wooden roller coasters that you see on p e is the most adventurous thing I've ever done in my life. Of course, I would definitely love to try scuba diving and skydiving because those sounds really, really fun. And I hear my friends talking about them, but I'm just always in a corner like a turtle thinking I can never do those things. I will never be able to achieve. Thinking about it sometimes makes me sad, but sometimes I'm pretty proud of myself for even going on the roller coaster. I remember the first time when I went on, I was screaming my my throat out. Everything was crazy. I came off thinking, wow, that was so fun. So I technically enjoy stepping out of my comfort zone. Maybe one day I will be able to try skydiving and scuba diving because those sounds terrific. And I would be able to tell my children, able to tell my friends that I've done them and make them feel proud of me too. So of course, those are definitely things that I thought many times before doing. And hopefully I get to step out of my comfort zone and do more adventurous things that I wouldn't think I would do it now. Back to you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Speaker 4. And we do have Speaker 3 on with us now. Speaker 3, what is the most adventure ride, adventurous ride you have ever taken? What is the most adventurous ride you have ever taken? Speaker 3. Good morning, honorable judges, fellow cadets, and distinguished guests. We go on many ri different rides in life. They can be metaphorical, they can be physical. But I think the most adventurous ride that I have been on was a mix of both. Little backstory here. Around five to 10 years ago, uh, I was at a summer camp and we went to the Peony. It was one of the first days I was pretty shy back then, so I didn't really have that many friends to talk to. In addition, I had never really been to the Peony before, nor have I ever been on one a roller coaster or any other amusement park ride for that matter. And so when we first got there, my entire group, they wanted to go on the small wooden roller coaster. And I didn't want to, but I didn't want to bring my entire group down. So I went with them. I didn't know what to expect. I have to admit, I was a little afraid because I'd never been on a roller coaster before. But I still went in with an open mind, a bit scared, but I still did it. On the twists and turns, the short track, that experience made my life change forever because it inspired my love for amusement parks and roller coasters. It helped me make friends who I'd never really talked to before, who I still talk to today. And so, yes, the physical ride was adventurous because it helped me gain a love for something that I still enjoy today. But the metaphorical ride was also something that really helped me, especially in a time of COVID, for example, where you can't really connect with a lot of people in person, I could still connect with the friends that I made at that amusement park on that ride, which is why that was such an adventurous experience for me. And because the ride, it wasn't the most adventurous part. It was the experience that came from the ride that I think had the biggest impact on me. I was inspired by that love, I still am today. And I think that that, is a reason why that is so adventurous to me and why I still go on rides to this day. For example, I went to a, I went to Universal Studios a few years ago. I went on every single ride there because I had a love for roller coasters and rides. I wouldn't have that if I didn't go to the Peony. Just a small example to really see the big impact that small wooden roller coaster had on my life. Thank you, Speaker 3. Speaker 2, uh, what is the most adventurous ride you have ever taken? What is the most adventurous ride you have ever taken? Speaker 2. Thank you very much. Now, I would like to take you back to the week of January the 20th, uh, June the 20th, um, 2021, uh, the Monday the 21st, seven days before my birthday. I got a couple of buddies of mine together, some crazy buddies, numbskulls really. Uh, and we said, hmm, well, since this is all our, our last year in high school, um, I think we should do something really fun. I think we should, I don't know, get together and, and go for a trip. And I said, all right, that's great. But we don't know how to drive. And so, uh, so we, we got our minds together and we said, hey, we'll get, our bikes together 
and we'll go for a bike trip, all of us together, we'll go for a ride. And I said, okay, well, where should we go? And took a little bit of brainstorming and we decided, Victoria. Now, if you know kind of the lower mainland region, you'll know that there's a bit called the Sunshine Coast. That's the bit I live on. And if you take, if you go north on the Sunshine Coast, you'll go to a place called Power River, where there's a ferry over to Comox on the island itself. And so we said, what better way than to go that way? We'll go one big loop up through Comox, down the island, down to Victoria, and then across to Vancouver and back up. I said, this sounds great. It's only 500 kilometers. We should be able to do that in five days. That should be easy. So we get on our bikes and we start riding to Comox. Well, like I said, I didn't realize that my friends were numbskulls. Uh, and so one of them didn't bring the right gear and all of his stuff, stuff kept falling out onto the road as we're riding along. The other guy brought a bike that's older than my dad. Uh, and so it kept busting all the time. And it had terrible gears, so we would have to sprint up the gear, up, up hills, uh, etc. And he would be worn out, like after anything that we did, just because of his horrible machinery. And I'm sitting there with all my fancy gear, because you know I actually care about this, and I spent some money on my gear. So a long day of riding later, about a hundred kilometers, once you include ferries, we get to Comox, and the next day we get on our bikes again, and we ride to, to an Nanaimo, that's the end of day two. And as I'm chilling with my buddies, after we've done all this stuff, as they say, yeah, you know, I don't think this biking stuff is, is for me. I, I think uh, they're ready to go home. And they just left me, they left me there. The beginning of the third day, they take the ferry back home and I'm stuck here because, you know, I can't quit. So third day, get on my bike and I ride to Victoria. There's something in the way between here and Victoria. It's called the Malahat. Malahat is a series of mountains, steep, rough mountains that I have to climb, arduous. Fourth day is one of the hottest days in, uh, in the history of, uh, of um, the lower mainland, 35 degrees. Fifth day, super, super tiring. I get through it. It's one of the hardest things I've ever done in my life. I'm super proud of myself though. And I tell my biking friend, I say, look, I've done this. This is super, super fun. I recommend you do this. And he said, oh yeah, I've already done that ride. That's a lovely ride. I did that once in three days and it was one of the calmest rides I've ever done. And so that was my lovely disappointing cap on my story for my longest, most adventurous ride I've ever taken. Thank you very much. Thank you, speaker two. So perfect timing. Here we have speaker one. Speaker one, what is the most adventurous ride you have ever taken? What is the most adventurous ride you have ever taken? Speaker one. Good morning, judges, guests, and fellow cadets. My topic here today, as you've heard, is what is the most adventurous ride you have ever taken? And my first thought, given this question, was roller coasters. It must be that. That is what I must tell you all about. All the excitement of getting in line and then sitting down, putting your buckle on, and going for the ride. And then I imagined it more as, what ride have I taken that's taken me on an adventure? And honestly, I didn't know. At first, I sat there thinking, what will I tell them all about? What rides have I been on? Car rides? And that was it. Car rides. I've sat with my family in the car for extended periods of times. Sometimes boring. Sometimes I got into arguments. But those were the rides where I really got to know who my family was. Every weekend, I would go on a long car ride, an hour each time, back and to. Um, to Maple Ridge, from Vancouver all the way to Maple Ridge. And though it doesn't seem that far of a distance, it really got us connected. We joked, we talked about our entire week, and really it was the best time. We would tell stories and sometimes reuse stories, and we would even tell jokes. And I would share my, my rants about my teachers, about my day at school, and really it was just an adventure. And yeah, 
my roller coaster rides might have been adventurous, but it was just seeing my life flash before my eyes. But really, going on a car ride with my family really got me thinking, this is how I see the world. My brother, the jokester he is, he would always tell me the jokes, and I would look at him like, what are you saying? But really, this was the time when I got connected with him. He would tell me all about his day at school, and I would tell him his. And it was just the best time. And so from this, I learned that I learned from connecting, sticking with family is the best time that I could have. Thank you. And thank you, Speaker One. And uh, at this time, we have concluded all our speeches for the impromptu. Uh, we will have our judges and tellers uh, and timer move back into the judges room and they can deliberate and uh, email forth those uh, numbers and our tellers can do their magic uh, at this time while they are doing that we will have an interview and get to know the cadets that have just performed for us today and it looks like Captain Douglas's screen has traveled back in time and we have a younger Mr. Douglas with us. Hello, national winner. Hello, ma'am. How are you doing, Matthew? I'm so wonderful, thank you. I was glad to see you and hear from you there. This is a warrant officer first class this year. Matthew Douglas, our national effective speaking winner and he has done an amazing job and he will be here to give a little speech later on. But now that we have our contestants, let's shine the spotlight on our speakers today. So let's start with speaker one. Oh, speaker, oh, that's right. Speaker two, you have two on, sorry. Always catches me off guard. Speaker one, introduce yourself and tell us which squadron you're from. Hi, everybody. I'm Sergeant Lee Zawa Aisha, and I'm from 59 Squadron. Um, yeah. Welcome. Thank you very much, Sergeant Lee Izawa. Uh, so let's, uh, what's your favorite subject? My favorite subject at school is, it changes every year. <laughs> um, but this year it's English, yeah. English for this year? So what's the previous year? Previous year was social studies. Yeah. Oh, okay. That's good. To Depends know. on the teacher. Oh, that's what it is. Yeah. <laughs> All right. No problem. Now, uh, since we've been two years uh, away, like social distancing and restrictions, what have you learned? Is there any hobbies or anything that you've kind of uh, learned new during this two year period? Um, well, during quarantine, I tried a lot of new things. There's so many new things that I could have tried with all the time I was given. And new things that I've learned, I guess, with more opportunities being online, I was able to take part in more. And so doing like this, it was one of the more the newer things I've tried, like effective speaking, and also joining a lot many more clubs, which is fun. Yeah. All virtual during that yeah. time, wasn't it? Yes. Uh, cooking. Have you picked up cooking or was it more yeah, academic? I tried. <laughs> I tried cooking. Yeah. And baking as well. Yes. Especially when you're at home, uh, we use uh, the resources that we have uh, available to us there. Now, now that we are going back in person, uh, what is your favorite uh, training that you like to do at Five Nine Vancouver? Um. Honestly, I like being, it's, we're having a hybrid. So it's like online one week and then it'll be in person the next. And well, my, one thing is just, I really like being with my fellow cadets, like in my level, it's it, online. I think our relationship grew a little bit more, our like entire level. And so I like seeing them every other week. Yeah. That's fabulous. Now, uh, future goals. Future goals. Um, hard questions hey? yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um I think it's to get into more of these kind of things like effective speaking debate I think it'd be really good for me to be able to just do more yeah 
Oh, for sure. Especially effective speaking, uh, not to toot my own horn here, but effective speaking is such an important skill that everyone should uh, learn and improve on. Uh, I myself need to improve uh, daily on effective speaking, and uh, it just benefits us in multiple ways, uh, ways that we would not even think of. Um, so that's fabulous. That's great to hear. All right. Thank you very much, Speaker One or Sergeant yeah. Lee Azawa. Thank you. Uh, next, we have Speaker Two. Introduce yourself with your rank and your name and the squadron you're with. And we'll have uh, Warrant Officer First Class uh, Douglas, if you'd like to interview them. Thank you, ma'am. Oh, Speaker Two. Hello, you. sir. How are you doing? Um, I'm Warrant Officer Second Class Aiden Clearantera from 858 Skookum Chuck Squadron here on the Sunshine Coast. Where are you from, sir? <laughs> Same place. Isn't that crazy? Oh, wow. So, would you like to introduce yourself? What are you, what do you like at school? What are some of your passions? What are your interests? Hmm. Well, uh, passions, interests. Uh, well, I already talked about cycling, which is kind of one of my things. Um, I'm in cadets. That's one of my things. Um, I, like, uh, I like woodworking quite a bit. Um, I enjoy messing around with things that break so I can break them more and then pretend like I fix them. Um, I changed a tire recently. In school, um, science, science and math, and that's about it, because science and math are tangible, and everything else is up to the teacher's opinion, and I don't, I don't do that very well. So, uh, those are probably my fortes. Okay, so since we're here with effective speaking, what do you think is the most important part of any speech when you're making your speech, when you're writing it? What are you thinking about the most? Well, my cadet and Toastmasters training uh have me believe that it's the introduction and the conclusion uh which i would generally agree with but i think um you know there, there's there's a little bit you know there's got to be some attention placed on on delivery and specifically engaging the crowd um obviously a bit harder virtually but you know having a joke in here or there or having a pause to make people think that's probably the biggest part unfortunately that's the bit i struggle with the most so <laughs> Okay, um, thank you very much. Um, I want to ask Cleveland here. Yes, sir. Um, speaker three. Hello, sir. Oh, um, so introduce yourself. Where are you from? All right, uh, so I am Sergeant Lee Ryan. I am from 111 Pegasus Squadron, also in Vancouver. Uh, yeah. Awesome. Um, so I have a question. What has been your best experience with cats so far? Uh, from cadets, so I've had maybe like one, one and a half years of actual like in-person training before COVID hit. I have to say one of my highlights was definitely going to GT because I got to meet a lot of uh, new people, had a lot of new experiences, and I'm still in contact with some of them today. And I learned a lot of uh, really valuable stuff as well. Awesome. GT, good times. Um, so what's your favorite part about school? Part about school? Well, it kind of depends on the teacher because like I sometimes like certain courses except if they're taught in a certain way or if like a certain teacher like is the teaching the course it either makes it a lot better or it uh, sometimes takes away but I'd have to say generally I'd probably say something like math or maybe even something like socials because those are some things that really make you think and like test your logic skills and really help you earn skills that aren't just used in like those subjects but you can use in the real world as well. Right, yeah, I like that. Um, so why are you here at the Effective Speaking Competition? Why did you think Effective Speaking is so important I should be here? Well, ever since the pandemic hit, I've, uh, I've had a lot of free time to do stuff. And uh, public speaking was one of the many things that I picked up. I felt like I kind of like this. So then when I heard that uh, Cadets was also offering Effective Speaking, I was like, okay, I'm going to go try this. And this is my first time, but I've had a great experience so far. Yeah, you've done so brilliantly, all of you have. Thank you very much, Sergeant Lee. Thank you. On to speaker four, Corporal Lee. Hi, um, where are you from? Um, I'm Corporal Lee Jessica, and I'm from 135 Bell Irving in Vancouver. I'd like to start with uh, judge number one. Um, he is actually my oldest friend. Um, I, I knew him since I was eight years old, if maybe not earlier. So it's really neat having him on board with us today. Um, and so his bio is that he started public speaking as a member of Order of Demolay 
which is an organization for uh, young men uh, 13 to 21. So he's been speaking in public for a long time. Um, in 86 to 88, he was a Seaforth Highlander. Then he transferred to the regular forces in, in September of 1988 as a safety systems tech. Um, he spent 10 years at the Cold Lake Squadron with 410 and three years in Cold Lake with 441 Squadron, and then five years as uh, in Cold Lake as well as 1AMS. Um, he worked for the Aviation Life Support uh, where he was in charge of the airbags and oxygen and everything like that for the F-18s and all the other type of planes. Um, he actually flew um, almost 20 hours in the back of an F-18. And uh, he's retired in 09. Uh, again, he's uh, very distinguished, uh, welcome full of knowledge and just a wonderful friend. So thank you very much, Mike, for uh, coming today. So thank you. And uh, number two um, is also distinguished. She, her name is Janice Parkinson, and she's the distinguished Toastmaster. Now, I just found out there's less than 2% of people who are in Toastmasters have this distinction. So uh, well done and congratulations, Janice. Uh, Janice has lived on the Sunshine Coast since 2018 after retiring from a, a career in software development and a life in the Lower Mainland. Uh, she's been active in Toastmasters since 2001, and as part of her ongoing as a part of her ongoing professional development, uh, she loves to read, garden, and play computer games, and is currently re re uh, rediscovering how to cook or to bake. Sorry, I'm looking forward to trying some of your baking. Um, Janice, thank you very much for taking part in this today. It's much appreciated to have your knowledge and your expertise here. Now. Yes, thank you. Big claps. Awesome. Yay! Um, we also have a tag team, uh, Dr. Edith Kirkpatrick and Thomas Kirkpatrick. Um, and they have just renewed their wedding vows after 30 years. Um, they have one Facebook account. Um, they have been sharing, so they trust each other with everything. So it's really neat having them here today. Um, I'm going to start with Edith. Dr. Edith Kirkpatrick holds a Bachelor of Arts and a Master's of high education, Higher Education from the University of British Columbia and has a Doctorate in Educational Leadership from Simon Fraser University. She is the Associate Dean of Health Science at Douglas College, where she enjoys working with students as they explore their academic interests, critical thinking, and presentation skills. Dr. Kirkpatrick is also a faculty member at the BCIT, where she requires her students to create and present their original assignments to the fellow students. Uh, Dr. Kirkpatrick knows that uh, the skills you are developing through your participation in this effective speaking competition will serve you well in all aspects of your life. So thank you very much, Edith. Um, Thomas Kirkpatrick is a chartered professional accountant as well as a real estate appraiser. Mr. Kirkpatrick has an MBA from Simon Fraser University and undergraduate studies in real estate appraisal, real estate assessments, and real property management. Uh, Mr. Kirkpatrick is a member of the Appraisal Institute of Canada, a real estate institute of British Columbia, and the British Columbia Association of Chartered Accountants. Um, so a wealth of knowledge there, and thank you very much for coming to um, judge for us and co-team. Uh, those are our three judges. Um, I'd also like to thank our timer, Ms. Morgan Macbeth, uh, she is uh, also with Toastmasters, and she also holds the Distinguished uh, Chartered Member as well of Toastmasters. Uh, our tally person, uh, Miss Victoria Gaisley. She is a past president for our squadron, and she has done a lot of work with this, and she is just phenomenal. Um, our, our impromptu supervisor is Miss Catherine Chalk. She's also with Toastmasters and also, uh, 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 I think, with 888. Um, or though she's a league rep with BC, BCPC. Larry Dyke is in here. Larry Dyke is one of our CIs and he's helped out with our uh, breakout room. So thank you, Larry. Um, and also my wife, uh, Sarah, who is also um, our, what did you call her? Tech support. Tech support. <laughs> and she does it so well. Um, so I thank you very much all for helping and participating in today's. Uh, also Jermaine, 
Um, she has been the Toastmasters and she's the, been putting this all together for a couple of years now, making the sure through the COVID that the, our effective speaking is actually working for what it's doing. Uh, without you, this would not be happening. And not just with our squadron, but it's also happening up to the uh, uh, provincial and national level. So thank you very much. Uh, awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, just clarification. I'm not with Toastmaster. <laughs> I, I still need to have the confidence to join. But uh, thank you very much, Captain Douglas. You and your team at 858 Skookum Chuck RCACS has been paramount in having uh, to host this, to keep their your cadets engaged and inspired uh, in this effective speaking competition uh, and program. Um, so I thank you very much for all that you do for the cadets and this program there. So thank you very much, Captain Douglas and your team. Now, I'd like to call on our judges. Do you have a few words for our cadets, please? Um, Mr. Gibbons, if you'd like to start with you. I was super impressed with all of the uh, presentations today. Uh, it shows a lot about what the effective speaking program in the Air Cadets is all about. Uh, to have five uh, cadets of this quality just from the zone, and it puts DC and the federal or the national standards. I'm just blown away by them. It's excellent. Thank you very much for inviting me to be a judge. It's uh, well worth getting up early on a Saturday morning. Thank you. And yes, I have been a friend of uh, Captain Douglas's for a long time, back when he actually <laughs> had hair. <laughs> <laughs> Well, good to know about Captain That's Douglas cool. there. <laughs> uh, thank you again, Mr. Gibbons, for your uh, kind words to our cadets. And uh, next, I would like to call on our uh, judge too, uh, Ms. Janice Parkinson, if you have a few words for us. Thank you. I'd like to reiterate what Mike said. You guys are fantastic. I am totally impressed. And you guys all have really, really great head start when you head off to university or BCIT. Because I remember 30, 40 years ago at BCIT, I did not have your capabilities. And when my instructor called on me to speak, I was one of those people who couldn't. You guys are not going to be in that place. You are excellent. You have a fantastic start. Good luck to, in the future for all of you. And thank you very much, Ms. Parkinson, there for your kind words. And I'd like to call on our, our tag team, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Kirkpatrick. Uh, either one can start, and I'll take comments from both. Thank you very much. Congratulations, participants. You, you have all done amazing work. Um, your, your presence, your thoughtfulness, your ability to think on your feet is, is impressive. Um, as Janice said, I wish I'd had that when I was your age. Uh, you're all to be congratulated. You've done really good, solid work, uh, which will stand you in very good stead as you move forward in whatever you decide to do in your future, whether it's academic or moving straight into the workforce, wherever you choose to go, this will be incredibly uh, powerful for you. Thank you to our fellow judges and to everybody who has been behind the scenes in making this happen. This has been a really good use of a Saturday morning for us. I am inspired by, by all of this. So thank you very much. I'll, I'll, just, I'll just jump in and say, I was impressed with your maturity and your grace under fire. Um, it couldn't have been easy. I know it's not easy to speak in public, but you did an outstanding job. And I'm not sure that the professionals I work with could have done better than you did. And I work with a lot of people who speak publicly all the time. So I'm very impressed by you. Congratulations. You should all feel very proud of what you've done today and be very impressed. And your parents should be very proud to have raised such outstanding young people. Well said. Bravo Zulu to all that are out here today. And again, I thank our esteemed judges for your time and your expertise in this event here. Uh, I am ready. And I'd like to actually see if there's any other comments from the floor here. We do have uh, Major Lee and Major Alguire here uh, as CEOs. How do you feel this competition went, Major Lee? Uh, thank you for having me here today. 
I just want to say congratulations and good job to all of the contestants today. You were great. Um, I appreciate the extra time that you took out of your busy schedule to prepare and compete in this competition. So good job, everyone, no matter what the results. Thank you very much, Major Lee. Ms. McBeath, I know I know you are such a, par uh, a pillar in this effective speaking in this region here. Uh, a few words for our cadets. Well, thank you very much. I was here for last year's speeches and I was expecting sort of the same. There'd be quite a variety in the abilities. The game has been upped. The levels between the abilities of the speaker it must have been very difficult to judge because each of them had such strengths and each of them delivered so well. I thought, this is really getting through. This program is really bringing these young people to come with their best. The research that some of them did, the way they delivered, the way they engaged with their audience, all of those things were noticeably different this year. Uh, congratulations to those who worked with these young people and congratulations to them for putting in the effort and thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. McBeath. It's uh, always a pleasure to have your comments and they uh, will treasure everything that you do for them uh, in this time here. I did see Major Algar come online for a bit. I was wondering, Mr. Uh, Major Algar, are you still present with us? A few words for yeah. our cadets? Yes, I'm here. It was uh, a pleasure to see the uh, the cadets today participate in the effective speaking competition. It's all, I'm always amazed and, and at times brings tears to my eyes to see how well these cadets do in effective speaking. It's an amazing start for them in life and uh, I wish them all the best of luck. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Major Alguire. Now let's have a drum roll. Uh, Captain Colosi, if you'd like to share screen, please. Perfect. So for the Greater Vancouver Region Virtual Effective Speaking Competition, our award ceremony starts with our bronze medalist. Our bronze medalist goes to um, Sergeant Lee Izawa Aisha from 5-9 Vancouver. Congratulations. Okay, let's keep it going. Silver medalist. Silver medalist goes to 111, Sergeant Lee Ryan. Congratulations. And the big drum roll here for our gold medalist. Gold medalist goes to Triple Eight to Warrant Officer Second Class, Ty Megan. So congratulations so to all our cadets. Uh, no matter if you have a medal or not, I am so proud of you uh, as cadets coming out to this competition. This is the plaque that uh, will have engravings of the gold medalist name. And then uh, we will also have our provincial effective speaking competition on April 23rd, 2022. Uh, the, room, uh, the Zoom link will be forwarded on to uh, everyone in a mass. I believe it's already gone out to everyone. Otherwise, you can certainly reach me at effectivespeaking.bcpc at gmail.com. Uh, the times, I have changed it this year uh, just so we can have uh, the rest of the Saturday to do as we may. So with that, uh, thank you, Captain Colosi. If you could stop sharing screens, I'd like to have uh, cadets. We will be mailing out the bronze pins, the certificates of merit with the judges evaluation forms as soon as possible. Judges, uh, if you have not given me your mailing addresses, uh, please email me those and the evaluation forms uh, as uh, we have concluded today and thank you again for your assistance. Our appreciation goes out to the coaches, officers, judges, parents, and the regional host squadron 858 Skookum Chuck uh, for locating the volunteers and helping make this year's virtual effective speaking competition such a success. Our, our gratitude goes to BCPC for their support in this effective speaking program. This concludes our 2022 Go, uh, Greater Vancouver Virtual 
effective speaking competition. I thank everyone for your time and have a great rest of your day.